Welcome to The State of Us. Real people with honest opinions and the future of responsible media. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. The House of Representatives voted to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2025. That's right. Now, will the Senate pass it? Well, that's a different question. The bigger thing that we want to look at is, why do you care about this? Uh, If the Senate's not going to pass it, which, let's be honest, they probably won't. They're probably not even going to vote on it. They're probably not going to vote on it. Then why does any of this matter? Well, first off, from a high-level standpoint, let's just say the Senate does pass it, you would care because this would have very significant economic implications, Uh, if you would be affected, chances are everybody will be affected by the wage increase. So even in other words, even if your wage isn't going to be forced up by raising the minimum, it will in turn push other wages higher as well. So there's a decent chance that you could be affected by that. Uh, And then there's the quality of life thing. If you're somebody who would directly be affected by it, in other words, you're making 10 now and you'll be making 15, that's going to have a significant impact. So there's a lot of ways you could care. But the reality is if you're part of America and you in any way rely on the economy, like if you go to the grocery store, uh, this is relevant to you. The discussion about minimum wage is relevant to you. Now, whether or not this particular vote is relevant to you, Well, we'll let you decide that. But we're going to broaden out, talk a little bit about this minimum wage, what's actually going on, the facts of the situation, which can be foreign in today's world, but also look at the horizon and if there's a better alternative. But of course, we couldn't begin this critical conversation on minimum wage without your friendly redneck liberal, Lance Lance Jackson. Jackson. Well, you know, it is interesting. I think when I was reading the article, the, the news briefing that came out, it hasn't been raised since 2009. Correct. The longest time in history since we established a minimum wage. Yep. So, and it's interesting too now for sake of clarity and since we try to have honest, open, and respectful conversations, the $15 would not go into effect until 2025. And this whole campaign, if you didn't know about it, this has been going on since about 2012, right? That people have been arguing for a $15 minimum wage. And I think it was very important that the leader of the group that has been pushing for this, because it really didn't go in the article at all, didn't say it at all. It's like, um, we wanted this in 2012. By the time it comes to fruition in 2025, if it were, which, you know, this law probably isn't even going to, that was a little late for what we wanted. But anyway. Her name is Heidi, and she's an economist at the Union Funded Economic Policy Institute. And she said, quote, the fight for 15 was launched in 2012, and every year that passes, the purchasing power of $15 goes down, end quote. And this is from the New York Times, by the way. Right. So <clears throat> that's my point is 15 sounds great if the Senate were to vote on it, which they're not going to, at least if you believe uh, the senator from Kentucky um, who's – Allowing things to be put up or not put, ah, put the, on the, the senator floor. from Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Who's that, Lance? Um, What's you know, his name? It's the name of which I do not want to speak. Oh, right. now friendly redneck liberal. Mm-hmm. That's that's what the intro said. Yeah, Mitch McConnell, Mister Senator Mitch McConnell. I know his name. I didn't <laughs> want to say it. I don't want to give him any publicity. I gave him due diligence. But that's because you're frustrated with anybody in Congress when they hold up a vote. Right. right? Which the House does too. Uh, Not in this particular case, but that's because they knew they had the votes. In fact, the article, right, even points out that this was something originally thought that the Democrats would do right away once they gained control. But good old Nancy Pelosi decided, nope, because it's not going to pass yet. So we're not doing it. And that's why it's taken up until now to actually do this. So I'm just I'm just tired of <laughs> let people vote. That's the whole thing that we're I yep. don't know. That's what I thought we were about. Get them on the record. Yeah. I, don't I let know. them don't let them out of it. Well, see, the other thing that people think they say, well, I mean, maybe, it's frustrating. Okay, it's 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 past the house, and now it's just going to sit probably, and he's not going to even allow for a vote to take place. Okay, if if you're going to defeat it, then go ahead and let him vote and defeat it. Right. It, I mean, if you feel that strongly about it, then don't you want yourself on the record I, as voting against it? Right. I just. And if just, you don't feel strongly enough to feel that way, 
then maybe you shouldn't be voting no in the first place. But the reason it's not going to pass isn't because Congress is against it. The reason it's not going to pass is because one person decided we're not going to vote. Well, our, that our, seems wrong. Our friends that at, seems wrong in a democracy. I agree. Our friends at No Labels, right? They had a they have a plan. <clears throat> I used that. them today with a gentleman who stopped to talk to me. Yeah, yeah. I used No Labels. I said, you know, we, we there is a nonprofit who a few years ago came out and said these are the ten most divisive topics in the United States right now. And they went out and they canvassed and they found that almost seventy percent of Americans agreed. Democrats, independents, Republicans, 70% of Americans across the board agreed on what the answer was. And these are supposed to be the divisive issues. And 70% of Americans agreed on what the solution should be on each of these 10 issues. I mean, somewhere between 65 and 77% on every question. And it was a, there was a bipartisan group who hooked onto this and nothing changed. We're still saying it's divisive. It's not divisive if seventy percent of us agree on it. That's not divisive. That means that means pass the law. Well, uh, I don't want to get close to the microphone because I'm getting ready to yell and rant and rave. I don't want to break people's eardrums. They're trying to tell me to get closer. It just started this morning. I didn't get enough sleep. I just it just makes me mad when we don't things really aren't a problem. It's the this- people that are in charge that are the problem. Most of us are rational people who can agree on some sort of solution, except for the people that get elected to office. When you let the politicians, and, and I don't want to say, again, politicians broadly, the the bad politicians and the cable news media get involved, that's when it all, in my opinion, Lance, that's when it all goes to hell. Because that's when- but they're it, not supposed to be involved. But that's when it becomes either or, instead of, you know, what it should be, which is I think what all that- all that money they spent, right, to do these surveys to find out when they removed the politics and they just said, here's this problem, right? Mm-hmm. And here's some ways to fix it. Do you like the, these options to fix it? And again, we took out who was putting it forward, just the idea and the solution, right? The problem and the solution. And you have right. all these people that agree on it. So what that tells us is not that America is as far apart as what we continue to be led to believe. It's that we're allowing, as Lance has pointed out, people, a select few people, both in government and in the news media, to drive this wedge and say, well, no, you know, we can't like that because the Democrats like it, or we can't like that because a Republican likes it, which is, I'm sorry, a ridiculous reason not to like something. It's just silly. I agree. And we're seeing that a little bit in some local stuff going on right now, right? Where you show some people the data and they've been so trained, again, not, I'm not, at them specifically, I'm saying it, sh- it just shows how trained certain people have become by their leaders and their news media that this is just bad, you know, and I can't take time to consider that it might not actually be bad. I'm sorry, we got a little bit away from the minimum wage, but the reason hopefully that our listeners are sensing that Lance and I, that this is so frustrating to us is so much of what we cover can be solved and it can take good ideas, usually from both sides, a little bit of each, and we could actually move forward as opposed to what we have right now, which is just we just sit because, you know, well, they proposed it so we don't like it because that's our whole platform, which is basically what both sides have. And so nothing happens. Yep. And, that's and what it's, just, right. it's no way problems don't get solved. No when, way to move things forward. When according to, to no labels, 70% of us agree on an answer. Yeah. That just doesn't make sense. I don't, that's not making America great. And I'll just stop there because I don't like the again. Yeah. Just at all. Because America is, I mean, as much as, as much complaining or frustration that's in my voice, it's, we're still the best place, but come on, let's just, let's move on and let's get going again. Yep. Let's, get, let's get to, you know, to solving some of these, not solving, but at least voting on some of these issues so we can have Move some the solutions. Needle, you know, it, it's not going to get quit, any better. Quit if we sitting don't, on dead center. If we do nothing. So <clears throat> back to the minimum wage. 
um, which is, of course, what we started on and what this topic's about generally. This whole idea of $15 an hour, it's, it actually has been, I think, quite some time since you and I discussed this, Lance, on, mm-hmm. on the state of us anyway. Um, but we have researched a lot more, uh, particularly probably in the last eight to 10 months or so, this whole notion of a minimum wage, right? A- yes. And how to manage it and navigate it. And in full transparency, the reason that that's been of interest is particularly related to my political campaign right now for an elected local office. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't negate a lot of what we've learned, I think, by any means. It's a big motivation for it. And part of what I think we've discovered is that there are ways to raise wages that don't just leave businesses hanging. Because the thing that has always gotten me the most, and the reason that for a long time, and Lance will tell you, and I think he, I think I won't speak for Lance, but I'm pretty sure you were on the same page, that we were not really advocates of this whole, uh, just raise wages and everything will be fine, Mm -hmm. is because the inflationary effect of raising wages was a big concern. You know, it's if you don't give a way for businesses to offset this, then they're either going to fire people, right? Or they're going to raise prices or they're going to do both. Um, and what we looked at and started to investigate is, well, there's got to be an answer, right? There has to be something other than just that's what happens. And that's where we looked at, well, what if you do uh, a tax write-off for businesses to so that they can make that initial transition? Because then if you just set it against inflation lance so that it adjusts every year, right? Now businesses can take that change because it's it's marginal year to year. We're not talking about, you know, five, ten dollar an hour shifts. We're talking about, you know, a dollar, a few cents, um, not these massive swings. Well I'm okay with with it that way if that's what I have to have to get it raised. What's that? I'd the minimum wage is to give a tax benefit to businesses. I mean, I'm I'm okay with that. That's not the way I would like to do it. What's what's the way you'd like to do it? Well, but again, well, I would like to see it. I mean, if we're going to call it a minimum wage, then it should meet minimum requirements. And then I would go back to whatever like you said, if you want to tie it to the cost of living now, let's go back and tie it to the cost of living from from when it was put in during the Great Depression as part of a minimum wage, you know, as, as part of a wage price to get people money so that they could survive during the harshest economic time in American history, then let's figure out what it is there and let's go there. And then I also like, though, some of the stuff that we've looked at over the last few years where it needs to be adjusted by region and taking a look at some of the numbers because we all know – that different parts of the United States are cheaper to live in than others or are more expensive to live in than others. So, so a mandatory minimum wage across the entire country isn't enough. Right. And you know, we I mean, then have to play to the lowest common because, denominator. Because, you know, there are places where $12, you live pretty well. Mm-hmm. And there are other places where you will not get an, an apartment by yourself on $12 an hour. This is, this is not going to happen. Right. It's not even going to happen on $20 an hour, you know, mm-hmm. in Southern California. I mean, it's just not, that's just not going to happen. And yeah. so I like the regional idea and I would prefer that we just make it a minimum wage. What is the minimum, you know, to, to according to the government, I'll even go with the government. According to the government, what is the poverty standard divided by that 40 hours a week? Okay, that's what you need to make. That's what we, that's what we have it on. And then I would be in favor if someone wanted to to adjust it for the regionality of of cost of living. Right. Okay. But if that's not going to happen, I'm okay mm-hmm. with giving the tax break to business to get them off dead center to do it. Is there but a I reason wouldn't, I wouldn't go that way first? Why? No, I mean, is there I mean, is there a reason that we couldn't do both? I mean, because right, our solution that we proposed several years ago was exactly what Lance is bringing up, this whole regional, because we looked at it and we said, this is ridiculous, you know? I mean, we get the idea, right, of just a, a, a bottom barrel well, here's number. Well, here, here's the problem, okay? You talk about business and we all look at, at Amazon and Nike and, you know, all the big, huge corporations, right, the big Googles, 
and of course they're making tons and tons of money Mm -hmm. and they should be able to absorb this. You know, who cares if their stock value goes up another nickel per share? Pay your workers. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is when you talk about the majority of people who work in America work at small companies. And that's a, that's one of those misnomers, I think, that people don't realize. They think everybody works at, you know, a Honda, an IBM, uh, a whatever. They think they work at one of these big, huge companies. Most American workers don't. Most Americans work at a small, what is it, less than 200, 200 employees. Mm-hmm. I was going to say 500, but, you know, the majority of Americans mm-hmm. work somewhere. Yeah, it's one of those. Where it's there's less. 500 or 200. Right, employees. Well, those companies are going to take a hit. Yeah. You know, so. You give that thing out there and it's like, you're going to help business? Well, you know, the point is the the bigger businesses are going to get help and they probably don't need help. But where most of us work are small businesses and this would hurt small businesses, yeah. which is why. So I don't know. Maybe now I'm getting to be real finite, you know, real, real, real uh, finite here um, and say, well, only help businesses with – <laughs> Less than so many employees. Mm. Oh. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, that's, if, it, if, that's, if, it, that's interesting. If I were going to do it, okay. you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But I'm okay with if it. If Dictator Lance was in charge. Right. But if we can get to the point where we're going to raise them and wait, I'll do it almost any way I, I would have to. So I would take almost any plan because I think that we have to address the poverty level in the United States. That's That's a sad state of affairs when – Citizens of the United States are working and can't afford a roof over their heads and enough food on the table to feed their to feed themselves and their families. That's not what this country is about. So we're going to pick apart this a little bit more. Uh, but before we do, Lance, we want to take a minute and let people know why we're talking about this and why bother. You know, sorry, I just can't resist. If I tune in to Fox or MSNBC or CNN right now. My guess is, and I, I'd put money on this, Lance, if, if you're feeling in the betting mood. No. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll gamble a little bit. And I, I would wager pretty heavily that what they're talking about right now is the drama of Nancy Pelosi versus Trump versus Mitch McConnell versus, you know, the, the scandals and the, you know, and, and, and they're talking about, right, the immaterial, relationships and all of this going on, uh, they're looking at this through a lens of gossip, mm-hmm. you know, a lens of who said what, who's mad, who's, who's, you know, who's barking at what tree, all this, right? Probably so. I, I, I it, wouldn't bet against you. Instead of what you and I are doing, which is talking about, okay, since this issue's come up, let's look at the best way to actually address the issue. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's put forward these solutions, get that information out. What a notion for the news media to do. Provide an informed conversation, getting new solutions on the table. What a concept. But it doesn't get people. But that's because they don't. That's because they don't do it, Lance. I still contend that they have a big role, if not the signature role in determining what people care about. They have all this in all this data. Right, supposedly about what people why care can't, about. Why can't we have Walter Cronkite come back? I, I, your guess is as good as mine. Why are we here, Lance? What are you and I trying to do? True Chat's mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. Uh, gee, Bradley, you you think we're getting that done? What's your What's your take today? So far, I'm pretty pleased with the conversation. I'd say the mission's being hit around the head so far. Okay, and ju- and just to be clear, you are a peer of our other producer, associate producer, Caleb Spinner. Uh, and you both go to a, a community that's actually smaller than Urbana, where we're broadcasting, a neighboring community, right, of like uh, 2,000 or so, some people? Yeah, that's right about right. Okay. Uh, and so Bradley's, he's taken this in, right? And stereotypically, maybe Bradley's not exactly the the type of person that you would think would be receptive to this sort of thing. We, we, we're not asking him if he's sold yet. We'll get to that in a minute, but... Uh, and if you don't think that we're keeping in line with this mission, you go to ethics at truechat.org. That's ethics at T-R-U-E-C-H-A-T dot org. Before we talk more about the best solution to the wage and poverty problem in the United States, we're going to take a quick moment to hear from one of our sponsors. 
Welcome back. The House of Representatives has successfully voted to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. According to a New York Times article, the bill would more than double, Lance, the federal minimum wage, which is $7.25 an hour, about $15,000 a year for someone working 40 hours a week, or about 10000 less than the federal poverty level for a family of four. Mm-hmm. It has not been raised, as Lance highlighted, since 2009, the longest time the country has gone without a minimum wage increase since it was established in 1938. The federal government, for those that don't know, sets the floor for the minimum wage. States can enact a higher wage. Raising the minimum wage to $15 by 2025, Lance, will pull 1.3 million Americans out of poverty, and it could result in wage increases for up to 27 million workers. That's according to a recent Congressional Budget Office analysis. And now everybody's chiming in saying, oh, that that CBO, that Congressional Budget Office, man, aren't they partisan? Look at all those findings. But, oh, wait, oh, wait, but the Congressional Budget Office, you mean they did their job? But it would leave 1.3 million people or 0.8% of the workforce out of a job, the same study concluded. While the legislation would boost incomes at the bottom, it would cost richer households and would slightly reduce gross domestic product. So you get both sides. You mean you mean this is an issue, Lance, where it's not all positive, as some may have you believe, and it's also not an issue where it's all negative, as some others might have you believe? I guess not. It just drives me mad if people haven't sensed it yet. It does. I'm sorry. I just you just wonder why you know why does it have to be that way because it it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. And, and, and like you and I have said, we, we don't. He just here in the last few minutes. I would like to see it done a different way, but I'm willing to take something else just to get it moving right. because it's an issue that needs improvement, and. It, it, you can't just be all or nothing because then you're in the situation that it seems like we've been in on most instances with our government, and that is we get nothing. You know, there are a few things that they've passed. We've talked about them, you know, on this show, and unfortunately I can't remember any of them right now, but I remember we brought up, hey, we agreed on this law. You know, Democrats and Republicans agreed on this law. I mean, it's happened a couple of times in the last seven or eight years that we've been doing this show. But for the most part, it's it, not much has gotten done because it's, well, I didn't get everything I wanted, so I'm going to vote no. But did we improve the situation? Well, yeah, that would have improved the situation. But I'm going to vote no because I didn't get all I want. Or, well, I'm not going to give in on this point and this point just to get my first four points, because if I can't get all of my bill, then I don't want it, so I'm going to vote against it too, even though I supported it. I mean, doggone it. You don't ever make improvements that way. I mean, that's like, well, I'm not going to go out and cut the lawn today because I'm not going to weed eat. And if I'm not going to cut it, cut it all down and weed eat it and then pull the weeds by hand, and then water the flowers. And I'm not going to do that all today. And then I'm going to do nothing. That's right. You know what? And because, then you never do it. I because, can, well, yeah, because I can, <laughs> because then the, the, it just gets worse, right? More weeds, it uh-huh. grows taller. And then it's just going to take bail longer. It, mm-hmm. And I just, well, because <laughs> I'm not, because I can't do your it. lawn. <laughs> if I can't do it all, I'm going to do none of it. Yep. And that's basically what we've been looking at. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a good analogy. I kind of like that analogy. Here, I just came up with that one. If you like that one, let us know because that was that, I thought that was good. And I did not come up with that early. That was just spur of the moment. We'll have this article linked at thestateofus.org, the New York Times one that we're mentioning. But another a website that I want you all to check out. So this isn't an article, just a website. The National Low Income Housing Coalition. Okay? I like that. The National Low Income Housing Coalition. Check them out. Because they've got this real nice chart that they just released um, in an insider article. Uh, I think it was a it was a few months ago now, maybe maybe end of last year. Um, so it's very it's very recent data. And they did this state by state state by state breakdown, Lance, of the hourly wage needed to afford a two bedroom apartment. Oh, there right? we go. Yep. So so not lavish, right? Mm-hmm. Just a, just a two bedroom, just a two bedroom apartment. Okay, 
So what is the state-by-state -state breakdown? Now, we're not going to read all 50 states for you, but before we, before we reveal the real numbers, let's just have a little fun with this and uh, see, Lance, what state do you think is the lowest? And you don't have to give me the number. Just what to, is- To rent a, a two-bedroom? The I hourly will... wage needed to afford a two-bedroom apartment. What state has the lowest hourly wage needed? Not oh, has not has the lowest, the cheapest but, part, hmm. but needs the lowest hourly wage. I would say Mississippi. That's a good guess. What do we think, uh, Bradley? I'm going to go with. <laughs> he probably doesn't know many states because you know they don't teach. I don't think they yeah. don't teach that anymore, do they? It's it's been a minute. I guess I'm going to go with Texas if I have to guess. Oh, see the problem with Texas, Bradley, is you've got uh, Houston. Yeah, uh, you've got you've got a Dallas, lot of Dallas, Fort yeah, Worth. You've got these big cities, and they're going to drive. So it's Arkansas. My second guess would be Wyoming. You were close, Lance. Yeah. It's right in your t it's right in your uh, your old stomping ground. It's in that that whole area there is is relatively low. Um, any guess what the hourly wage for the state? Okay, so again, this is important to understand. It doesn't mean, for example, when I tell you what Ohio's is, there are places in Ohio that you can get a two bedroom apartment for less than this. Okay, but this is the statewide average hourly wage needed for a two bedroom apartment. What's the guess, Lance, for Arkansas? How much, how much does someone need to make to get a two bedroom apartment per hour? Okay. Well, I'm not, uh, yeah, I am. I'm going to. Are we talking about when they say you need 25% of your income for your rent after taxes or 33% of your income before taxes for they're, they're a, saying, a place to live? Keep in mind, they're saying this is just the apartment. That's what we're talking about. Well, I know, but you, 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 <laughs> Okay, I'm going to do a quick economic thing here. When people go to look for a place to live, mm -hmm. the rule of thumb is that you should not pay more than 25% of your take home a month for that. Right. And more than 30% or 33% of your gross income when you're looking for a place to live. So that's what I was, I was, that's what I was trying to figure out. Is, the way I understand that this so was, was done. What are, what are they saying the cost is? is I, am I allowed to spend up to 25% of my monthly income? What the way I understand that this was assembled. Okay. And this, this drives the point home of wages all the more is they looked at the average rent prices in the area. Okay. Okay. Across the state. So they looked at the lowest, the highest. They, they did the numbers, right? And they said, okay. So this is what the average cost of rent is. Okay, I'm going to say that the average and then cost. And they said, how me, how much would you have to make per hour just to afford that? And see, the affords where I'm coming. So I'm going to have to make four times what the rent is because then my rent should be one fourth of what I'm making. Right. So I'm going to say that the rent is in Arkansas average is five hundred dollars for a two bedroom apartment. Which means if I'm going to, is to I got I have to earn two thousand dollars a month. 40. You got a guess, Bradley? Bradley's is going to be more uh, more laid back than Lance's very exacting calculation. My uh, original plan was just to agree with Lance, but if I'm going first, <laughs> that's what they. That usually, was a good plan. That's yeah. what they usually say. What's? Can you tell me what it is here in Ohio? Yes, it's fifteen twenty-five. I would say it's ten dollars and twenty-five cents. It's fifteen twenty-five here in Ohio. Okay. To afford a two bedroom apartment. Lance, what'd you say? I'm going to go with 10 and a quarter to live in Arkansas. Do you want to stick with that now that you know Ohio? Yeah. I'm, oh, yeah. That, I'm using my math here. <laughs> but go ahead. You want to go higher or lower than, than, uh, than me, Bradley? I'll, I'll go lower. I'll go. Uh, we know Arkansas is the lowest, so it can't obviously be the same as Ohio. Right. So yeah. Be lower, less than 15. Yes. Plan, so you, how well I'll you, go. I'll go 950. Okay. See where that. Ooh. He'll say 950. I said 10 and a quarter. And the answer is thirteen eighty four. Wow, it's expensive well, to live in the great that. state of Arkansas. <clears throat> Not cheap. Mm -hmm. Not cheap. Uh, and there's some places too that might surprise you, uh, Bradley. Your great state of Texas that you're hoping to live in, nineteen thirty two, is what you'd need to make hourly for wow. that two bedroom apartment. If we look at Alaska, twenty four dollars and eighty cents. And if you want to get crazy and look at some place like California, thirty-two dollars, Lance, and sixty-eight cents an hour. I could have told you that. Yeah, 
We were actually looking at that the other day. <clears throat> right. So the point here in looking at all this is... Hmm. Still 13 in Arkansas though, right? That's right. Wow. 1384, almost 14. And that's the lowest. That Nobody's lower than that. Missouri, Lance's home state, 1546. So it's right in there with Ohio. Same thing for Kansas. Um, How about Indiana? Indiana is it? It's it's right in the same ballpark, fifteen fifty six. Because their minimum wage in Indiana is a whole dollar an hour less than Ohio, and neither one of them are close to that. No, I mean, in Indiana, I think it's under eight. So the minimum wage in Indiana would have to double, right, to, for a person to be able to afford a two bedroom apartment, mm-hmm. right? Because if it's if it's under eight and you're there at fifteen something, wow. So, so, so about, fifteen doesn't even doesn't even cut it, dude. Let me throw out this solution for you, Lance. Let's see if this is All this right. is the best case. Okay, we only got a we only got a little bit of time. Left. Go right ahead. So we've been talking about there's definitely there's definitely an issue. We didn't even get into poverty rate, right, and all this. We're just talking about what you would have to make today to afford an apartment. Mm-hmm. So you can dislike that, you can not be pleased with it, uh, but it is what it is, right? So correct. When we're looking at Don't this, argue with us, argue with the numbers. Yeah, yeah. And don't argue with numbers, you know. You can propose a different solution, but please don't argue. It's just, just, ah. <laughs> Sorry. I know. <laughs> Sorry, I we know. wasted a few seconds there. I wasted a few seconds just on it. It frustrates me so much. There is something to be said, Lance, for questioning statistics and looking at how they were arrived at, much like you were doing, but not for the sake of just completely disowning the point that's being made. Exactly. From research, you know, you have to take it all lightly. You and, know, and, I agree with you, but I, but I want to say that for our audience because I do think it's important. I'm not suggesting that you not be critical and just take everything at face value because I don't. I think that would be short sighted. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do believe that we need to be more accepting of research and data. We've become so questioning of it, and it's not questioning either. That's the thing, Lance. It's just looking for ways to defeat it. You know, so the solution. You switch to a regional wage-based system, okay? Mm-hmm. So there, in other words, there is no single federal minimum. The m- federal minimum is based, I would say, probably down to a state scale, factored on something along these lines. Not a two-bedroom apartment, obviously, but do a real cost of living analysis so that it is a living wage. I've never loved the term minimum wage, and I know that living wage is one of those buzzwords that's thrown out there by Democratic candidates right now. But that's what we're talking about. I mean, what good is a, you know, what does minimum mean, Lance? What what does that mean? Does that mean, you know, I can, I can buy some bread and I can eat that and live in a box. Eat peanut butter and jelly every night. That's, that's not what we're talking about. I can work, I can live in a slumlord's place, you know, and uh, there's mold and rats and all. I mean, Let's be real, right? We live in America, so people shouldn't have to live in those types of conditions. Correct. We want a wage that is respectable. You know, you don't have to live lavishly, but you need to be able to have a roof over your head in a place that you feel safe in and put food in your belly, Mm -hmm. right? Um, A fair day's pay for a fair day's work. So regional wage-based system. It's set against inflation. So after this is established, set against inflation, you move to a five-year – so for the initial phase in. Because once you've done this and you set it against inflation, the beauty is you mostly just leave it, right? You just let it – you let it do its thing. I mean, you got to check in on it. But as long as it follows – You should be able to buy just as much. And I guess – I don't know what the exact term is, but same thing with deflation. It doesn't happen very often in this country because we're used to, you know, consistent growth and so forth. But in other words, if the economy takes a downturn, right, like it has, Mm -hmm. and we actually see deflation, the devaluing of the buying power, uh, then in that case, what the wages would be would drop accordingly. In other words, it's a sliding scale. As long as things are going up, it goes up. If they go down, it goes down because Mm -hmm. that's that's how it it ebbs and flows, right? Capitalism. Mm -hmm. Um, So you set it against that. But to phase it in, you have a five-year phase in, and that whole time, if you are what the federal government classifies as a small business, which is either that 500 or 200 level, you are able to write off the full cost of raising wages on your federal taxes, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you're above that threshold, then we give you a 50% write-off. So you can't write off the whole amount. 
but you can write out part of it. So we're saying, you know, we're not just going to slam big business. We are going to give them a little bit of a break, try to make it easier for them. And this is just for the phase in. Once the phase in is complete, all of that goes away so that the tax base returns exactly like it was. And then it's set against inflation up and down, ebb and flow. And, and states, and for what it's worth, I'm still fine because I, Lance knows I'm usually a pretty big proponent of states' rights. If they want to do something beyond that, more power to them. Right. You know? Sure. Fine. You do what you want. You know, you're a state. You got that right. But we're going to make sure that the threshold is set. Um, and then if you want to improve your standard of living beyond what we've established as cost of living, you know, then you're welcome to, to look into that. And encourage states to to go to a regional system in their own state, um, knowing that living in a place like Columbus is not the same as living in a place like Urbana. Those are two cities in Ohio, for those that don't know. There you go, Lance. That's my my proposed federal solution. Okay. Okay. Got it. Can 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 you agree? We, we you okay know, you with that? You basically just built up built yeah. on what I said. So yeah, I'm there. I just tried to bring in the business you, component. Right. You brought you know, in that and added that to it. So I'm I'm there with you. I'm good to go. Everybody can be happy. I well, you know, seventy percent of us can. That's right. Which I think is fine. It's a pretty high number. I like that number. So Lance, we've challenged people to tune in. They can do that at stateofus.org, right? Mm-hmm. The stateofus.org. And there's these great links there. So you right. pull it up on your phone and you only do this once. You pull it up on your phone and you tap where you listen to podcasts. And what are some of those places, Lance? So when well before that though, so when Justin refers to the you know, the the pie chart or the graph, you can actually see it now. Correct. Because over years, you guys haven't been able to see it, and I've had to try to describe it for you. But you can go to Apple Podcast, uh, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere else fine podcasts are found. You know, look us up, listen to us, give us some feedback. Look at my charts. like to know how we're doing. Yep. You know why we do so many articles with charts, because my boss is a visual learner. He likes charts. <laughs> I do like the charts like to visualize the data, take it all in, right? For the State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, I'm Justin T. Weller. And I'm Lance Jackson. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're very thankful that Bradley took time to actually speak for the first time on the air today. We'll see you next time. Be the change.